Okay, but now I want to move to the next topic, um, which is the topic called the capital asset pricing model. And it's, in some points, the high point of the class. It used to be the high point of uh, finance. Uh, the theory hasn't worked out as well as people thought uh, in recent times, but it uh, is quite a great achievement, and a lot of it was done here at Yale. So I want to ex uh, explain it to you. So you see we have a problem so far. If everybody's trying to hedge, that means everybody's trying to get a completely you know, riskless payoff, it's impossible because, I mean, there's real risk in the economy. And, and, so how, and what do we mean by real risk? Well, something in one state is just going to be bad for the whole economy compared to another state. Maybe we'll run out of oil or something like that. It's impossible that everybody can consume the same thing in every state. So it's impossible that everybody can perfectly hedge. But everybody wants to perfectly hedge. So what has to happen? What gives? How does the theory have to change? Well, the theory is going to change in a simple way, which Shakespeare himself already knew and already told us about in The Merchant of Venice. What's going to happen is everybody is going to try and hedge as much as they can by diversifying. But because there's some real risk in the economy, in some states, things will be, uh, in the aggregate, worse than they will be in other states. So what's the consequence of that? The consequence of that is if you're going to buy an asset that pays something that's riskless, you're going to pay the discounted expected return of the asset. But if you're going to buy an asset that's risky, you're going to need a higher rate of return. So the price will be less than the expected discounted payoff. So Shakespeare, remember, said exactly that. When the, uh, the play begins with Antonio uh, looking melancholy, melancholy uh, his inter interlocutor says, Solerio or somebody, asks him it's whether he's worried about his businesses. He says, no, I've got a different ship. Every ship's on a different ocean. So I'm diversified. I'm not that worried. So Shakespeare knows about diversification, and that's what everybody should do. But then when it comes time to pick the caskets, to get to marry the beautiful Portia, who, by the way, is not just beautiful, but she's rich, so they're looking for a prize. The, the, uh, but they sign a contract that whoever picks the wrong casket not only doesn't get Portia, he can never marry anyone in the future. So what's the purpose of that contract? It's to make it a very risky gamble. And so why did Shakespeare want to make it a risky gamble? So he could explain he understands risk and return. So you remember the conversation where everybody says, well, I'm not going to pick this unless, you know, it's only because she's so rich and so beautiful that I'm willing to do this. The return is so high that it's worth the risk to me. So Shakespeare already understood that things that are risky are going to have to be priced less than their expected return, so uh, expected payoff, so the expected return, that is the payoff per dollar put into it, looks higher to compensate you for the risk. So Shakespeare almost had the whole story. What's missing from Shakespeare? Well, what is the definition of risk is missing from Shakespeare? And it will turn out that it's going to be a very surprising definition. So the purpose of the model I'm going to explain is how do you measure risk and how should that affect the price of things and how does that affect all the analysis we've done so far? Okay, so that's the topic of the next couple lectures. So the first person to confront this problem in a, and propose a solution, a mathematical solution, was the mathematician Bernoulli and his brother. So the Bernoullis were a famous mathematical family. Uh, and one of the brothers went off to St. Petersburg, where he ended up dying shortly afterwards. But he invented, uh, he, he noticed the following puzzle. Suppose I, and some of you have heard this, it's called the St. Petersburg, para Pe Petersburg Paradox. So suppose I offer you a bet. I say, uh, I'm going to flip a coin. And it, you'll, I, I, I keep flipping the coin until it comes up tails. And uh, I count how many coin flips I've, ha I've counted until you get tails. And if that's n flips, you get 2 to the n dollars. So if you flip it one time and it comes up tails right away, which is probability a half, you get $2. If I flip it two times and it gets heads and then tails, OK, that's with probability a quarter, you get, you flipped it twice, you get 2 to the 2 or four dollars. If I flip it three times and I get heads, heads, tails, the odds of that are a half times a half times a half, which is an eighth. But then you'll get two to the three dollars. OK, so four plus eight plus 
you know, 1 over 2 to the n times 2 to the n plus dot, dot, dot. So Bernoulli, the one who died, um, you know, told his brother Daniel about this and he said, well, you know, I've offered this bet to a bunch of people and I asked them how much would they be willing to pay for this risky asset. And, I mean, what would you pay? Let's hear some numbers. How many dollars would you pay if I offered you this bet? I'm going to just keep flipping a fair coin, count the number of flips until a tails, and pay you two to the n dollars. So this is the expectation, which obviously equals infinity. So according to what we've said so far, you should pay infinite amount of dollars for it. But Bernoulli couldn't get anyone to offer him that much money. How much would you offer for this bet? I just want to hear some numbers. Dollar fifty. Okay, anybody else have any? Uh... It's pretty conservative. I mean, that's almost ridiculous, in fact. You're guaranteed two dollars no matter what happens, right? So you're paying a dollar fifty and you're going to get two for sure. So that's a pretty conservative number to say. Anybody a little more venturesome than that? You can't do worse than two dollars in this bet. What? Four dollars. Okay. All right, so Bernoulli asked a bunch of people, and the average of what they say happens to have been $4. <laughs> That's what they said on average. And so Bernoulli said, well, this is amazing. The expectation is infinite, and they're only willing to pay me a miserable $4 for this. Now, the real reason might have been that they didn't believe Bernoulli was actually going to pay the money. And uh, you know, they'd give up their money, and they weren't going to get anything back. But let's ignore that temporarily and take it seriously. Bernoulli said, the solution must be that people don't care about the dollar payoff, they care about the utility of the dollar payoff. So let's put in a utility function. So the utility of the dollar payoff would be u of 2 plus 1 quarter, u of 4 plus 1 eighth, u of 8 plus 1 over 2 to the n, u of 2 to the n plus dot, dot, dot. And so then he said, well, of course, why is that going to help? Well, because if the utility function, say, looks like this, so here's x and here's u of x, the more dollars you get, maybe it increases utility, but by less and less. So you're not really gaining much by getting these numbers way out here. They're not adding really much to utility. So you only care about these small numbers. I mean, you know, it's good to have more, but not much better to have more. So he said, lo and behold, if I put in log natural as my utility function, which this looks like. That's the graph of log natural. Okay, and I put this in. And now if you know a little bit of, okay, now you see this is easy to solve, to compute, because log of 2 to the n is n times log of 2. So the log of 2's come out, and it's just the sum, it's log of 2 times the sum, 1 over 2, times the sum of 1 over 2 to the n, um, times uh, n, so it's n over 2 to the n. So, it's the, so this is equal to log of uh, 2 times the sum n equals 1 to the infinity n over 2 to the n. Okay, that's what it turns out that this thing is. That, okay, so it's not just 1 over 2 to the n, which would have added up to 1, but n over 2 to the n. So the point is, because you have the log function here, this actually equals the log of 4. So anyway, you, I've worked out the arithmetic. It's very simple. You, just have, you all know how to sum 1 over 2 to the n. You probably don't know how to sum n over 2 to the n. You never thought of doing it before. But the same trick gets you to be able to sum n over 2 to the n. It's obviously more than 1 over 2 to the n. In fact, it's equal to 2. So this sum is equal to 2. And 2 times log of 2 is log of 2 squared, which is log of 4. So by plugging in, instead of, instead of caring about the expectation, you care about the expected utility, you can explain why the per average person was willing to pay $4. Because the expected log of this is equal to the log of 4. This is equal to the log of 4. So Bernoulli thought he brilliantly explained his paradox. So this is the other brother, Daniel. The, do the dead brother posed the problem, maybe solved it too for all I know, but the one who the, the other brother, who still lived, came up with the uh, solution, maybe with his brother, that it's uh, 
you know, people don't look at expected payoffs, they look at expected utility of payoffs. And the utility should have this concave feature that more and more payoff adds on the margin less and less utility. So the, this is, so you note that this function satisfies d squared u of x dx squared is less than zero. Second derivative is negative. Okay, so the margin utility is declining as you get more and more. So that was the first, um, th that was the first advance on how to deal with risk. Now, actually, Bernoulli didn't really solve the problem because, you know, just saying that you replace utility with, I mean, the payoff with expected utility of a concave function, you know, this log wouldn't have really solved the problem because suppose that Bernoulli had offered instead a bet not of 2 to the n, but of 2 to the 2 to the n, you know, much more generous bet, okay, then even with logs you would have gotten an infinite number. So basically he should have said that you maximize, that people care about a concave function of payoff where the function is bounded, unlike log, which is not bounded. But anyway, let's leave that aside. Should be a concave function. Okay, so to put it another way, a concave function has the property, if you look at it, you know, let's say it looks like that, that if you have this payoff xA and this payoff xB, and you've got, so this is the utility now, here, xA, and this is the utility u of xB, and this is the utility u of xA. If you have a 50-50 bet, of either getting XA or getting XB, you're going to end up with this expected utility. Your utility is going to be half of UXA plus half of UXB. That's what we had down here. Half of this utility plus half of, of that utility, assuming nothing else can happen. Okay? But if you give the person half the amounts of money, for sure, okay, then he gets this utility, which is much bigger than that utility. Okay, because this is a concave function, the extra you gain by winning the bet compared to getting the average for sure, the extra you gain doesn't drive the utility up very much because it's flattening out. Whereas losing the bet, even though you're losing the same number of dollars, because from here to here is the same as from here to here, the loss of the same number of dollars is more important to you than the gain of an equal amount of dollars. And that's why you'd rather get the middle for sure than having a 50-50 chance of going on the extremes. So Bernoulli pointed the way to the modern theory of risk aversion, which is to just assume risk aversion in modern economics means people care about expected utility. Okay, maybe discounted, expected discounted utility. Expected discounted utility where the utility is concave. Okay, so whatever utility function we wrote in here, maybe it shouldn't be log, it should be something else. How would people evaluate this? They'd evaluate it log of four. In other words, they'd say, take whatever that constant utility was, which was log of four, that produces the same utility as the random gamble. So this random gamble gives this expected utility, which is equivalent to having that for sure. So here's the four. Okay, so, so four for sure gives a utility, log of four, that puts you here, which is the same as the expected utility of getting the random gamble. So that's what, uh, okay, that's the modern theory of risk aversion. And it explains why people would rather have things for sure. Okay, but, it's now quantifiable because if you can't have something for sure, if you can't have something for sure, then you know that it's more dangerous, but with this concrete utility function, you can find out exactly how much you're willing to pay to transform you know, this risky gamble into a safe gamble. You'd give up this much expectation in order to get the payoff for sure. Okay, so we're gonna turn in something into a, a, a vague theory into something quantifiable and get a surprising uh, conclusion. Okay, so that's step one. We now think about people maximizing utility. Well, of course, we thought about that from the beginning. The very first class, you had utility and diminishing margin utility. So actually, this risk aversion, 
with diminishing margin utility, fortunately for us, is exactly the same thing we've been thinking about all along anyway. Diminishing margin utility for consumption. So the very assumption of diminishing margin utility that we made from the beginning is also explaining risk aversion. So it's incredibly fortunate that we don't actually have to change any of our mathematics. And, and we've explained a new phenomenon. Okay, now the, the most simple utility function is either the log one or the quadratic. So remember, u of x equals you know, a plus bx minus cx squared. Okay, now I'm, you know, adding a constant is never going to change anything. So I'm always going to write this as ax minus 1 half alpha x squared. Okay, that's going to be my uh, utility function, my quadratic utility. It could be like this or it could be like that. If you add a constant, you know, which doesn't depend on x, that's not changing what anybody does, so that's irrelevant. And if I divide it by a constant like b, that's not going to change what everybody does, so I might as well assume the quadratic utility is x minus 1 half alpha x squared. Quadratic utility. So that's about as simple as we can get when we're used to working with those kinds of utility functions. Now, why is that such a good, convenient thing for us to use? It's because, let's suppose now that you've got this random payoff, where with probability gamma 1, you're going to get x1, probability gamma 2, you're going to get x2, probability gamma s, you're going to get gamma s. Okay, so what's the expected utility? The analog of Bernoulli, that means u is going to equal summation s equals 1 to s of gamma s um, xs minus 1 half alpha xs squared. Okay, so that's all we're doing. We're just saying that people don't care about the payoffs. They have to evaluate getting x1, x2, or xs. They're going to take, going to multiply the payoff by the expectation, but not look at the payoff itself. Look at the, the utility of the payoff. Now, quadratic is very simple, and the reason why we're going to get such a beautiful theory out of it is because this number, you don't have to keep track of all the x's to express this utility. We're going to be able to summarize it incredibly simply. This is going to equal some function f of the expectation of x okay, and the variance of x. So all we're going to have to worry about is the expectation of x and the variance of x. And so many, many very complicated things we can think about very simply. So more generally, if we put the log instead of the quadratic utility, we couldn't get this simplification. And so the theory would have to be more complicated. So the beautiful theory, the capital asset pricing model, comes out of using this simple quadratic utility. So why does it get so simplified? Well, if I just write it out, u is going to equal the summation of gamma s xs. So this is s equals 1 to s. I've let my probabilities be gamma. I don't know why I chose that. Minus 1 half alpha summation s equals 1 to s of gamma s xs squared. OK. Well, here we have the expectation of x already. Now, what is this 1 half alpha gamma s xs squared? Well, if I wrote xs minus the expectation of x, and I sum this squared, okay, that's equal to the variance of x. That's the def, oops, times gamma s. That by definition is the variance. But if I wrote this out, what would I get? I get summation s equals 1 to s, gamma s xs squared, okay, which is what I have over there. And then I'd have, you know, what, well, what would I have? Minus 2 times summation gamma s excess expectation of x, okay, plus summation s equals 1 to s of gamma s expectation of x squared. Okay, but what, uh, what's this? The second term minus 2 times that, the expectation of x is a constant. 
So I can take that out, minus 2, expectation of x. can take this out. And notice that summation gamma s excess, that's the expectation of x as well. So that's just minus 2 times the expectation of x squared. And so this, I can take the expectation of x squared out. And the summation of the probabilities is 1. So therefore, I just get equal to summation s equals 1 to s gamma s x s squared minus expectation of x squared. So therefore, this up here is equal to the expectation of x. Okay, so what have I got here? I've got this term. So I've got the variance of x equals this summation x s x s squared minus expectation of x squared. So this term equals the variance of x plus expectation of x squared. So therefore, I've got this minus 1 half alpha expectation of x squared plus uh, minus 1 half alpha variance of x. Okay, that's what the uh, that's what the algebra gives me. So why is that again? Because the given quadratic utility up here, that thing, <laughs> getting old. Given the quadratic utility up there, I can write it as this and this term. This term is obviously the expectation of x, but this term is just the variance of x, okay, plus the expectation of x squared. So when I subtract it, I keep the expectation of x minus the expectation of x squared. That's the first term. And then I've got minus the variance of x from that term times the 1 half alpha. Okay, so you see that depends on the expectation of x in a positive way, assuming alpha is a small number, and in a negative way on the variance of x. So just as I said somewhere, I said it was going to turn out like that, and it did right here. The utility is equal to the expectation of x and the variance of x in a positive way on the expectation of x and in a negative way on the variance. Okay, so now we're ready to start the analysis. We've, we've said, okay, so far we've assumed people only care about the expectation. And then we said, well, we know they don't only care about the expectations. Hedge funds and everybody else, if they know what they're doing and they're trying to keep their investors happy, they're going to hedge. We didn't say why they're going to hedge, we just asserted. They like to hedge so their investors don't get mad at them. But really what we had in mind is the investors have some utility function. They don't like risk. So the, so the, the hedge fund is going to try and keep the payoffs steady. But there's a trade-off. You know, you can't eliminate all risk. So how much is the hedge fund and the investor going to suffer if all risk isn't eliminated? Now we have a way of quantifying it. People care about the utility and not about just the expected payoff. And so you add more risk to them. You replace a sure thing with a risky thing with the same expectation. They think it's worse, that much worse. Okay, and so we've said that of all the myriad of utility functions we could use, log, you know, some exponential e to the minus ax, x to the r, there are lots of different utilities we could use. We're going to deal with the quadratic because it has the simple property that in evaluating an entire risky proposition, People care about the expectation, which is what they cared about before, but they're punishing themselves for getting a bad variance. Okay, so because that's such a simple thing to say, we're going to get a simple conclusion and a very surprising conclusion. Okay, so let's now analyze a problem and see what would happen. Okay, so the problem I'm going to choose to analyze is this one. I'm going to say that there are three things can happen in the economy, both with probability, sorry, uh, the first three, uh, anyway, those are the probabilities. Okay, now there are many firms in the economy, A, B, and C. And let's say the first firm, I don't want to invent the numbers here, so I might as well just write down the ones I picked. The first one's going to be 50, 175. Okay, B, the other firm, is going to be 150, 180, and 365. And C is 
It's going to be 300, 220, and 60. Okay, and I'm going to say, so those are the three things that can happen in the payoff of the three firms. And let's say there are two agents. Agent Alpha uh, owns uh, A and also 133.5 units of X0. Okay, and Beta owns B and C. And I may have reversed these two guys. Uh, Okay, and 66.5 units of X0. Okay, so here we go. So by A, alpha, and beta, I mean there are a million alpha agents and a million beta agents, and you know, they, you know, so everything can be scaled by a million, because I want a big economy like we always have. Okay, so there we have it. We've got now a risky world. Things can happen to the, okay, so what are the utilities? Let's say utility now, of alpha is going to equal, sorry, I left out the main <laughs> point. The utility of alpha is going to equal a half x0. I just made up these numbers, by the way, they're not. So summation uh, s equals 1 to 3, gamma s, that's the gamma s up there, times xs minus 1 over 400 xs squared. The states. So there's S1, so here are the states. This is state 1, S equals 1, S equals 2, and S equals 3. So those are the three possible states, just like we had before with this payoff, and those are the payoff of all the assets. Alpha owns firm A, which is producing that output in the three states. And also owns 133.5 units of X0. So over here, alpha is owning 133.5 and beta is owning 65.5 of consumption at time zero. So this is time zero. This is time one. The end of the year. So by the end of the year, something is going to happen. There's a lot of uncertainty between now and then. Some of the firms are going to be paying off in some of the states. And Badly in other states and so on. Okay, and so the utility function for alpha, he cares about consumption at time zero and also in each of the three states. Okay, but now he's going to have these quadratic utilities. He's going to say to himself, um, I care about my consumption and whatever I'm going to consume. If I consumed, if I just hung on to my A in state one, this would be. Okay, if I, if I never traded, I just hung on to A, the utility function would be, you know, this uh, quadratic thing of 133.5, so it'll be um, 133.5 minus 1 over 400, 133.5 squared, okay, plus um, he would end up with 50 minus, uh, 1 over 400 times 50 squared times a quarter plus, you know, 100 minus 1 over 400, 100 squared times a quarter plus 75 minus 1 over 400, 75 squared times a half. That would be his utility if he never traded. If he just stuck to A, he'd, he'd eat his own Consumption endowment 133.5 at time zero. Oh, that isn't true. I wrote down the wrong utility at time zero. I said it's time zero utility is a half x zero. So it's a half 133.5. Okay, so we get a half 133.5, but in the future, he'd get this and he'd get 50 in state one, okay, 100 in state two, and 75 in state three, and that's the utility he'd end up with. But that's not very good for him because he's running this gigantic risk. He's got this risk at time, you know, state one is a disaster for him if he just sticks to that. So he doesn't want to stick to that. So how should he evaluate the shares of firm A? How should he evaluate, you know, the shares of firm B, which he could get if he gave up some of A? Or how should he evaluate the firm, you know, shares of firm C? What should he do? Okay, so beta 
has a similar utility. Beta's utility, u beta, is going to equal one, 3 quarters x0 plus the summation s equals 1 to 3 gamma s times xs minus 1 over 800 xs squared. Okay, so I've made these guys, far from being impatient, they seem to, uh, they seem to prefer consuming in the future till now, but um, okay, that was poor choice of numbers, but let's, you know, these, this, this number should be bigger than one and this should be bigger than one, but anyway, uh, I, I put a half and three quarters. Okay, so there's impatience built in, except it goes the wrong way. That was just poor choice of numbers. But the rest of it, uh, 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 you know, expresses their risk aversion. So alpha is looking at the expected payoff of what he gets to consume in the future, but he's punishing himself by the variance. So you look at this formula, you see it's not just the expectation, but he loses something because of the variance. And similarly, beta, he's looking at consumption today, he's adding to that the expectation of his consumption tomorrow for his utility, but he's punishing himself for having variance in the future. So it's exactly what we formalize Shakespeare's idea of people not liking to be exposed to variance, to uncertainty, which we've quantified by calling variance. Okay, is everyone with me now? Yes, good. I'm glad you had a question. I just made up those numbers. So that's the utility of alpha and that's the utility of beta. I could pick any people I wanted, I just picked those two people. Okay, now how, what, how do they differ? Which person is more afraid of risk than the other? Is alpha or beta more afraid of risk? Alpha is more afraid of risk, right? This 1 over 800 is smaller than 1 over 400. So beta doesn't really care that much about risk, or cares, but you know, is not going to punish himself too much by, by being exposed to risk. Alpha is not going to punish himself too much, but is going to punish himself you know, somewhat more. So alpha is more risk averse. Alpha is more afraid of risk, it seems. Okay, so I've taken two agents who are afraid of risk. One's more afraid than the other. And I've put them in an economy where there are risky things that could happen. And so we now have, we now want to work out a more sophisticated version of pricing and of equilibrium than we had before. So let me remind you that what we sort of have been supposing up until now is that the price, what would the price of A be if we didn't think about risk aversion? You would, so far what we would say, what would you say the price of A is? Price of firm A. Okay, if we didn't, you know, if we were naive, you might say it's a quarter, by the way, I hope I have those probabilities right. I didn't, you know, it's a, you'd say it's a quarter times 50 plus a quarter times 100, plus a half times 75. Is that what we would have said up until now? Even up until now, we would have been more sophisticated than that. Discounted, okay, times discounted. Okay, that's what we've sort of figured up until now. That's the logical thing to do. Well, but we ignored risk aversion. And we ignored it at our peril, because it's obviously important. I mean, Shakespeare, a literary person, he understood already 400 years ago that risk aversion was important. And there are facts that confirm what Shakespeare's intuition is. The stock market historically has had a lot higher return than the bond market. You know, even the, with the last stock market crash, of course, it came back a lot. You know, average since 1926, the stock market's made something like 9% a year compared to 2.5% in the bond market. So there's a huge disparity and after over such a long period of time. It can't just be it was luckier every year after year after year. Somehow people must have realized the stock market's riskier. And so, as Shakespeare said, they wanted a higher return, meaning they were playing a, a lower price. But how much lower? How can you figure out how much lower? 
So in this example, in other words, what is the price of A? So this is the wrong price of A, apparently, because it doesn't recognize risk aversion. OK, so what would, OK, so that's where we are. So everybody, any questions about what the question is? We're about to give an answer. But what, so you see what the question is, that our old methodology for figuring out prices um, that's taking expectation and discounting obviously can't be right because it doesn't recognize risk aversion. On the other hand, we always had a utility function in there from the beginning, even a quadratic one. So all we have to do is do what we did before and put in a quadratic utility and we'll probably get the right answer. Okay, so that's exactly what we're going to do. So Arrow, in 1951, this is the same guy who proved with De Bru the Pareto efficiency of equilibrium. He was my thesis advisor. He said, you know, we can do the same trick that Fisher did. So only he, for some reason, he never credited Fisher. I could never quite figure that out. He had some obscure Danish guy he credited. But anyway, apply Fisher trick, trick, and assume uh, firm dividends dividends are part of uh, endowments, look for GE, the general equilibrium, trading outputs, trading, you know, trading goods, okay, then go back to find out, then go back to deduce value of firms. Okay, now what goods are we trading here? That was a conceptual advance. We call them arrow, and then De Bru got involved too. Arrow De Bru, so De Bru was the Yale assistant professor, while Arrow was a Stanford assistant professor. So Arrow De Bru, state contingent commodities. So just as Fisher said, an apple today and an apple next year, even though they're identical apples, are different commodities with different prices because they come at different places in time. In fact, most people would prefer the apple today to the apple next year. So Arrow said, OK, an apple in the top state, uh, an apple in the top state, an apple in the top state is a different commodity from the same apple in the second state. OK, so it should have a different price. So we've got just our conventional equilibrium, according to Arrow, where as long as you have these Arrow state contingent commodities that you can trade, trading today, you can, buy, you can imagine today buying an apple if state one occurs, but not having to get the apple if state two or state three occurs. And that'll have a price P1. And today you could imagine buying the apple if state two occurs, a different price from the apple if state one occurs, and, and also an apple if state three occurs, which obviously is going to be more expensive or it looks like it'll be more expensive than the other apples because it's 50% likely to happen. And those are the prices we have to look for. And that's going to solve our problem because the prices of the arrow securities are going to be different maybe from the probabilities. And that's what will reflect the fact that when everybody's trying to hedge and not everybody can do it, you're going to have to change the trade-offs. So we've already seen this in our gambling thing, at least the prices. Remember with our bookies, the bookies were effectively willing. Remember there were two outcomes, you know, the Yankees win or the Phillies win. And if you paid, you know, you could get the bookie who thought the odds were 60-40 by paying, you know, 60 cents today, the bookie was going to give you a dollar if the Yankees won. Or paying 40 cents today, the bookie will give you, uh, you know, a dollar if the Phillies won. So we've already had these arrow contracts, these arrow securities, implicitly in our equilibrium. And those 60-40 odds, those were the opinions of the bookie, maybe not the actual probabilities. We said it, you know, the, the final betting odds depended on what the other bookies were willing to give. It didn't have to correspond to reality. There might not be a reality even. So here there's a reality, 25, 25, 50, but that doesn't mean that the odds, the prices that are going to quote it in the market will turn out to be that. We have to solve for equilibrium and see what they are. OK, so what's going to happen? Well, we can solve for equilibrium very easily. 
because we've done this a million times before. And I've chosen linear quadratic utilities, the kind we did on the very first day of class, because those are easiest to solve for equilibrium. You don't have to do, get involved in the budget set or anything complicated. You just set margin utility equal to price. So we know for alpha, sorry, we know that the margin utility of alpha at time 0 divided by the price 0 is going to have to equal the margin utility of alpha at each state s times the price ps. So the, the equilibrium, the arrow de Brew equilibrium, equilibrium is going to involve P0, P1, P2, and P3, the prices of the arrow securities, the present value prices. P0 is what you pay today to get the apple today. P1 is what you pay today to get the apple a year from now in state one. So these are the present value, present value, that's what Fisher would say, state contingent prices. The state contingent is what Arrow added. Now, you may ask whether there really are these Arrow securities floating in the economy, and we're going to come back to that question. But you could imagine all these Arrow de Brew state contingent prices and, and commodities, and those would be the prices we'd solve for equilibrium. So we get this over this, margin utility of that, okay? So what is this? And similarly for beta, marginal utility beta at zero over the price of zero equals margin utility beta S over the price of S. Okay, so what is this? For alpha, his margin utility of consumption is a half. Okay, we might as well assume the price at one of the prices is 1. Let's take this price to be 1. Okay, so beta, her price is 3 quarters, her margin utility is 3 quarters and the price is 1. What's his margin utility? It's in any state S. It's gamma S, gamma S times, times 1 minus 1 over 200 times XS. So I just differentiated this. I got 1 minus 2 over 400 times Xs. And what's her margin utility? It's gamma S in state S times 1 minus 1 over 400 times Xs. OK, so I know in equilibrium that's going to imply that 1 half Well, now I have to screw around here. So how am I going to, so I've got this thing over here, a half equals this thing over here. What? Over PS. Ah, glad that appeared. I was getting worried there. Thank you. Over PS. Okay, that helps a lot. <laughs> uh, the whole thing. So that implies that something like x, so this is what alpha is going to do, and this is what beta is going to do. So this implies x alpha s equals what? So if I multiply through by 200, and I bring ps over gamma s to the other side, and I do a bunch of stuff, I'm going to guess this is 200 minus 100 uh, ps over gamma s. How do you think that's going to play in Peoria? Let's see. If I multiply through by ps, I get if I multiply through by ps over gamma s, I get ps over gamma s times a half. Then I multiply everything through by 200. So I get 100 ps over gamma s. And then I get the 200 here. So, and the xs goes to the other side, and the ps over gamma s goes to the other side. So it's 200 minus 100 ps over gamma s. And this one is going to be x beta s is going to equal, well, I have to do the same trick here except I'm going to be multiplying through by 400 and taking 3 quarters, which is 300. So it'll be 300 minus um, 400. No, that was wrong. 400 minus 300 over PS over gamma S. Oh. 
Okay, because if I multiply through by 400, put PS over gamma S on the other side, I have 3 quarters PS over gamma S times 400, which is 300 PS over gamma S. This becomes a 400, and the PS gamma S went away, so I have that. Okay, so I know now, if I could figure out what the prices are, I know what everybody would demand in every state. Okay, so now, okay, so let me pause here. That was the first critical step. So what did I do? I said, it's a long story, a lot of years went into this. I said, people are risk averse. Shakespeare knew that. We want to quantify it. So we say people have concave utility functions. That quantifies risk aversion. We want to make a simple concave utility function. We pick quadratic. Okay, but of course we don't know what quadratic. Different people could have different quadratic utility functions. Then we do the Fisher trick and say that any equilibrium, as long as you can buy and sell every contingent commodity in the future, because all the arrow securities are there, it can always be reduced to general equilibrium, just like we did before. And so now you have to feed the endowments into the agents, I mean the payoff of the dividends into the agents' endowments. Okay? Um, but here, so we're gonna, we haven't done that yet, and then we solve for supply equals demand. So all we have to do is we have to have x alpha s plus x beta s has to equal the endowment of alpha and s plus the endowment of beta and s. Okay, but this equals, all right, so we have to do that for every s. So this is uh, 200 minus 100 ps over gamma s equals, um, okay, now we have to do it in state one. All right, so equals whatever they are. So what is endowment of s, uh, endowment of alpha and s plus endowment beta of s? We have to look at each state separately. And lo and behold, I picked the numbers so that if you add these all together, you get 500. And here you get 280 and 220 is also 500. And here you get 500 again. So lo and behold, there is no aggregate risk in the economy. Although the individual stocks are risky, the aggregate is totally unrisky. So I could put, so no matter what S is, I could put in 500 here. It's going to turn out that the total endowment of both people, because I've plugged the dividends into their personal endowments, added up the two people, it's 500. So it means that PS over gamma S equals What? Which I've forgotten something for sure. What? Oh, x beta. Yeah, yeah. So that's alpha. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 400 minus 300 p s over gamma s equals 500. Okay, so when I add this up, I get 600. Um, minus 400 p s over gamma s equals 500. So then I flip them on the other side and I get p s over gamma s equals a quarter. Because 500 from here is 100 and put the 400 on the other side, divide by it, I get p s over gamma s equals a quarter for all s. Okay, so what did I find? I found that in this, and so, every, so it's the same, p s over gamma s is the same. Okay, same in all states. Okay, so what would the price of A be here? What's the price of A in equilibrium? What's the price of A? I'm going to take the price of A should be, the price of A should be, P1 times 50 plus P2 times 100 plus P3 times 75. And what does that equal? Well, P1 is just a quarter times gamma 1, right? P1 over gamma 1 is a quarter. P2 is a quarter times gamma 2, and P3 is a quarter times gamma 3. So I just got this multiplied by a quarter. So in fact, all I did is I did what I had always done. I took the expected payoff and discounted it. The discount rate is a quarter. What's the price of the riskless asset? Pi of 111 is just going to be a quarter. 
because it's a quarter times gamma one plus a quarter times gamma two plus a quarter times gamma three. Gamma one plus gamma two plus gamma three is one. So it's a quarter. So it implies the riskless interest rate is what? What's the riskless interest rate? 300 300 percent. Okay, and that's why the disc, so we're discounting by one over a quarter because the interest rate is 300 percent. So basically nothing happened. We got all the prices exactly as we would compute them with expect, with, without you know, just doing expectations. We got the right discount rate. All we had to do was figure out the discount rate. So risk hasn't played any role. And why didn't it play any role? Because although Alpha started off owning A alone, which exposed her, forgot who was her and who was him, let's say her, exposed her to a lot of risk. She's not going to sit there stupidly just holding A. She's going to trade it for B and C for different shares. In fact, she's going to end up holding her consumption. This is her consumption, 200 minus 100 PS over gamma S. This number doesn't depend on S. She's going to consume the same thing in every state. By tr you know, and how can she do that? She can own equal shares of A, B, and C. She'll own a share of the whole economy. So in other words, by diversifying, by diversifying, alpha and beta each get rid of all risk. So instead of calling it diversifying, I could call it hedging. It's the same thing. She doesn't just hold her A, she mixes B and C with it so that she gets a payoff of consumption that's exactly the same in every state because PS over gamma S is independent of the state. She'll always consume the same thing. Everybody can hedge perfectly and there's no problem because there's no aggregate risk that anyone has to be stuck with. And therefore the price is just going to be the same as the probabilities, you know, discounted. And that's the theory we've worked with so far. So, so far you could say that everything we did was kosher. It's just that when we had these two different probabilities of things happening up or down, we thought that the aggregate economy would have the same endowments here as it did there. And therefore the probabilities we used were the, obs were the objective probabilities discounted. No reason to change them because nobody's going to be forced not to hedge. Everybody will hedge. Okay, so are there any questions about what I've said? I'm sure there should be a question because I can't have said it as clearly as I ought to have. So would somebody like to say something? Yes. Y right. This is the new price. With the one quarter, this is the correct new price. So the theory so far hasn't changed in any interesting way. We just found the discount rate. It just looks like expected utility. But you shouldn't have expected it to change because the aggregate endowment was 500, the constant in every state. Nobody, there's no reason why we can't have everybody uh, perfectly hedged and consuming a constant in every state. And in fact, that's what we did have. Everybody, she consumed the same thing in every state, he consumed the same thing in every state. No reason why they both couldn't hedge themselves perfectly. And in equilibrium, that's exactly what they did. Any other? Yes. Okay, so the next step is going to be, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to assume that the endowments don't add up to a constant in every state. Then what's going to happen? So this is not at all obvious how to solve this and what to do, but it's going to turn out to have a beautiful, simple answer. Shocking, not only simple, but also surprising. So any, before I do that, I'm going to change the endowments so they're not all a constant. Any questions about where we're going? Yep. Yes. What I prove, okay, so thank you for the question. Okay, so I went a little quickly. I said that what we proved by solving for the general equilibrium is that the price in every state was just going to be a quarter times the probability. Okay, that's what we showed had to happen in, in equilibrium. Now, what's the consequence of that? The consequences are twofold. Number one, the price of all the assets is the same expectation we naively would have taken before where we use the discount rate a quarter. Okay, so that, and that's the first implication. The second implication is that from the formula for consumption, we notice that she consumes the same amount in all three states because PS over gamma S 
is a quarter in all three states. Her consumption is going to be the same in all three states. And his consumption, which will be different from hers, but his will be the same in all three states as well. The two will add up to 500. So then I took a little bit of a leap and I interpreted that conclusion that her consumption doesn't depend on the state. What's the interpretation of that? She has obviously somewhere behind the scenes given up some of her A to get B and C and held them in a mixture uh, so as to get the same consumption in every state. What must the mixture be? Obviously she held the same proportion of A, B, and C because those add up to 500, 500, 500. So she must have held the same proportion of A, B, and C, a fraction of the market, and got a riskless payoff. So she diversified. She didn't just stick with her A, she substituted a little bit of A, a little bit of B, and a little bit of C, a different boat on every ocean, and now she runs no risk at all. So she diversified, but in the language we used last time, I could call diversification hedging if I wanted to. She just sort of sold aero securities in the right proportions to turn her A into something that was completely riskless. Okay, so whether you call it diversifying or call it hedging, she's achieved the same end of totally balancing her consumption. And everybody, he did the same thing. And they both could do it because the aggregate consumption was a constant. Yes? What would an aero security actually look like? In real life? Yeah. Okay, the closest we've come to an aero security in real life is a CDS. And this is part of the reason why these economists, Larry Summers, my classmate, and Ruben, who, you know, who uh, was the Secretary of the Treasury and ran Citicorp and who was a Yale Law School student and a Harvard undergraduate and who I've sat on many committees with, um, he, they were seduced by the, okay, so what's a CDS? A CDS pays a dollar if some uh, bond defaults by a dollar. Okay, so that isn't an aero security because an aero security is a much more detailed thing. An aero security says, I'll pay a dollar in state one. An aero security says you get an apple in state one. But state one, remember, is not described by a single firm. State one, the states of nature, are total descriptions of everything that could happen in the economy. So an aero security really says if it stops snowing in Siberia, if uh, the, you know, uh, Khomeini loses power in Iran, if uh, there's a favorable election outcome in Afghanistan, and uh, if uh, Obama wins re-election, and if uh, the U.S. solves the energy problem, then I'll give you a dollar. Okay, so the Aero Security lists incredible number of contingent things, every contingency possible, and says, in that case, I'll give you a dollar. A CDS says, if this thing happens, I'll give you a dollar, whether or not Obama wins election, whether or not America discovers a, a new source of energy, whether or not Afghanistan turns around, you know, just so long as the bond defaults, I'll give you a dollar. So the CDS is an event contingent. It's an event contingent. A lot of event contingent security, that's the CDS. And an aero security is a much more finely specified thing. It's a state contingent. You, you say everything that happens in the economy. So we'll never get to aero securities. But CDS looks like we're on the way to them. And these guys blundered by thinking since CDSs are on the way to aero securities, we should have as many CDSs and let people trade as much of them as we can. But we're going to get to that in the last lecture about how all that was a, you know, how all this theory, what's wrong with all the theory. But OK, so any other questions before we? Okay, so let's, uh, let's now make the change that he suggested up there. Let's now change the economy just a little bit. Let's eliminate C. Okay, so, uh, so this just disappears. Okay, so obviously now the total endowment is very contingent. It's 200, it's 280, and it's, uh, what is it, 440. Okay, so we now, now what do we do? So beta owns B. Okay, so now what's equilibrium going to be? What do you think is going to happen? So we're gonna, we want to quantify this. We want to give a beautiful, simple theory that's quantifiable. But what do you anticipate happening to P1, P2, and P3? So everybody's going to say, 
Alpha, she's going to say, look, my A is risky. I don't want to hold my risky thing. I want to start hedging and trading these arrow securities. So I get the same constant in every state. Of course, beta, B, beta who owns B, he's going to do the same thing. So they're both going to be trying to trade arrow securities. What's going to happen, you think? Yes? Yeah, there's no way that they can exactly, there's no way that each of them can be perfectly hedged. So no matter what they do, they're going to be exposed to more risk in state, you know, state three is going to be a great state, state one is going to be a terrible state. So what do you think that means about the prices? So there's no way to hedge, everybody can't be hedged, and so in fact what will happen is nobody will be hedged, okay, although alpha will be, who hates risk more than beta, will be closer to hedged than beta will be. Um, so beta will end up bearing more of the risk than alpha. And what do you think will happen to the prices of the arrow securities relative to the probabilities? Yes? There won't be a constant ratio of a quarter as we had before, but can you be more specific? Exactly. So that's what's going to turn out. Because everybody, the, the world is short of commodities in state one, there just aren't many apples. That's the disaster. That's when we, we can't solve the energy crisis. We're totally screwed, okay? People, everybody wants to consume more in that state. Everyone's going to try and hedge against that state. They're all going to be trying to buy aero securities in that state which means that because there aren't as many to buy, there's just not enough apples to go around, the price of aero securities in state one is going to be high relative to state three where everybody's, you know, you, you know uh, there, there's plenty to go around there. So she is going to sell some of her A and get some B, okay, to diversify, but B's got so good in state three that all of a sudden she's not going to be, you know, so worried about state three anymore. But state one, she's still going to be worried about. And there's nothing to be done about that. So the price is going to have to be very expensive in state one. OK, so well, all right, that's all blah, blah, blah. Let's solve for equilibrium and see what happens. It, we can solve immediately. Nothing's changed. The utility functions are the same. None of this changed. OK, so this board doesn't change at all. That's demand. Still depends on P0, P1, P2, and P3. But now we have to be a little bit more careful. In state one, so demand in every state is 600 minus 400 P1 over gamma 1 equals endowment of alpha plus endowment of beta. So in state 1, I'm going to now change this to a 1, although it's my handwriting, it looked like a 1 anyway. What's the aggregate endowment in state 1? The aggregate endowment in state 1 is, a is 200. This is a 1 now. Okay, that's 200. Okay, so that means P1 over gamma 1 equals 1, right? Because 400 and 400, so it's 1. So you're not discounting the first state at all. You're looking at the probability of it. But what if I go to P2 over gamma 2? Well, the demand is going to be the same. It's the price that's going to change to make up for the fact that the supply is much different, namely, Namely what? 280. Okay, so now if I subtract, I get 400, 280 minus that is 320 divided by 400, which looks like 4 fifths maybe. Two, 320 over 400, okay, is 4 fifths. Okay, and if I go to, right, because 320 divided by 400 is 4 fifths, so P2 over gamma 2 is 4 fifths, so they're not proportional anymore, and then P3 over gamma 3 okay, equals, now the outcome is um, 440. So if I subtract 440 from this, I get 160 divided by 400. What's that? 2 fifths, thank you. P3, P3 over gamma 3 equals two-fifths. Okay, so the prices turned out to be quite different. Now, the reason why 
they're slightly higher on average, of course, than they were before, is because there's less consumption in the future. We suddenly made our future much worse off. So people are more desperate to consume in the future. So that means the prices of future consumption are going to be higher. So we have two effects here. These prices, instead of being a quarter everywhere, are higher, much higher than a quarter, because the future looks so much worse. The interest rate is going to go up, uh, is going to go down. It's not going to be 300% anymore. But more interesting is that the prices are no longer proportional to the probabilities. Just as he said over there, the price in state one is going to be much higher relative to the probability, namely 100% of it, than the price in state three, which is only 40% of it. Okay, so that's the conclusion. So now what do we do for our price? What's the price of A? What's the price of A? What do I plug in here? That. Okay, so that equals 1 quarter times 50 plus um, 4 fifths times a quarter. 4 fifths times a quarter. 4 fifths times a quarter. 1 fifth times 100 plus P3 was uh, 2 fifths times a half plus 1 fifth times 75. Okay, which equals something, 20, 35, and 12 and a half, 47 and a half. Why did I what? Okay, so what is P1? P1 is equal to gamma 1, and gamma 1 is a quarter. So that's how I got a quarter here. So that's, that's 1 times a quarter. Okay, P2 was, two fi was 3 fifths. Now, what was P2? Maybe I did it wrong anyway. P2 was 4 fifths times a quarter times a quarter, okay, which is equal to 1 fifth. And P3 was 2 fifths times a half, okay, which is equal to 1 fifth. So that's how I got the prices, okay? So, all right, so you see that things changed, and we've captured the idea that people can't hedge fully by making the price of the arrow security in the state where the economy is worse off much uh, smaller than it was before. I mean, much higher than it was relative to the probability than before. OK, so, so we haven't gotten close to the punchline. Sorry, I got, OK, so we're about, yes. OK, so the prices, the two things happen to the prices compared to before. One is that we no longer have the prices proportional to the probabilities, right? Their, their proportion is 1, 4 fifths, 2 fifths instead of the same constant a quarter everywhere. And that's because the relative scarcity, people are much more worried about the first state than the fourth state. And that's why relative to the probability, the price is much higher than the third state. You, follow, you agree with that, right? OK, but there's a second effect, which is that all these numbers, 1, 4 fifths, and 2 fifths, they're bigger than the quarter, quarter, quarter we had before. But that's obvious. That's because we wiped out the future. You know, the, half the endowment in the future disappeared. So naturally, people are willing to pay more for the future because they're poorer there. That's what we, in the first day of class, we said that the interest rate, or you know, the third week, the interest rate, according to Fisher, would go down if you got poorer in the future. So that's part of the reason that's happened. By the way, what is the riskless rate of interest? So P1 plus P2 plus P3 equals what now? It's equal to um, a quarter plus a fifth plus a fifth. So a quarter plus a fifth plus a fifth. These are the prices. A quarter plus a fifth plus a fifth. And that's equal to 20, 10, 14 over 20. OK, so that's 5 over 7 over 10. So therefore, the interest rate, 1 plus r equals 10 over 7. So r equals 3 sevenths, OK, which is like 40%. OK, so the interest rate went from 300% to 40%. But that's because we lost all this future consumption. But that's not what I'm concentrating on. Fisher would have already known that. What I'm concentrating on is the fact that the prices are no longer proportional to the probabilities. You, you're discounting every probability, but adjusting the probability because people are much more worried about the first state than the third state. Not A, they're more worried about the first state. The 
pay, the, the firms are A and B. The states are 1, 2, and 3. So they're much more worried about the first state, where the payoff is 200, than they are about the third state, where the payoff total dividends in the economy are 440. Are you with me? Oh, boy. <laughs> that sounded so unconvincing. So let me just say, okay, I want to say the punchline. So I've got three more minutes to go. There are two punchlines, which are, okay, I haven't gotten to the stunning conclusion. So far, I've said stuff which is, uh, you know, which Arrow and De Bruyne had already figured out. But now I want to go to the thing that Tobin and Markowitz figured out, okay, which is one more step we haven't noticed yet. Arrow has already figured out that because not everybody could hedge, that means that the the, the price of an arrow security is not exactly equal to the probability. It's relatively high if the economy's poor, like in state one, and relatively lower if the economy's rich, like in state three. Okay, that's common sense. Now, what's not common sense is the extraordinary conclusion I'm about to show you. Let's look at what the consumption is, the final consumption of this, um, these two people. Okay, so if we look at the final consumption of these two people, what's her final consumption? So XA, okay, in the three states, it's 200 minus 100 times 1, okay, which is 100. What is it in the second state? It's, it's 200 minus 100 times, what was PS over, times 4 fifths, okay, which is uh, help, 160 maybe. Okay, and the last step was 200 minus 100 times um, two-fifths. Okay, two-fifths is 20, so this is 180. Okay, that's hers and his consumption in the future. I'll put a twiddle, I haven't talked about x0 yet. Is, is uh, 400 minus 300 times 1, okay, which equals 100. And here it's 400 minus 300 times four-fifths. Okay, which is equal to, help, four-fifths of 300 is 160, okay? And here, it's 400 minus six, no, 400 minus 300 times two-fifths, which is equal to um, 120, two, 280. Is this right? 100, 160, who told me it was 160? Yes, and what's that? Two-fifths is 120, this is 280. What? Which mistake is there here? Which, is this the wrong one? Here. 40, 200 minus 80 is 120, thank you. Okay, so these are all right now? 180 should be okay. This is this is 40, so this should be 160. Thank you. That's it. Okay, great. Okay, so now what's so shocking about those numbers that I finally got them right? Thank you. What's shocking is uh, this consumption is just the sum of the aggregate endowment. What's the aggregate endowment? Remember, the aggregate endowment is just one. Is just a 200. 280 and 440. So let's say you take a quarter of this, okay? So the difference is, let's take a quarter of that. That's 50, 70, okay? That's 50, 70, and 110. Okay, so a quarter of this plus, if you add to that 150, you're going to get all these numbers. So this person. Alpha A, I claim, just holds 150 of the riskless bond, pays 150, 150, plus 50, 70, and 110. That's, uh, no. Is this the right? Uh, let just, let's just check the number. Sorry, only one more second. I should have. Okay, so. 100, 120, and 160, that's the right number, and that's equal to 50, 50 of the bond plus um, a quarter of this thing. So 50 plus 50 is, okay, a quarter of this is 50, 70, and 110, right? So if you hold 50 of the bond 
plus a quarter of this, you get 100. 50 of the bond plus 70 is 120. 50 of the bond plus 110 is 160. And this guy is going to hold three quarters of the aggregate endowment, three quarters of the aggregate endowment plus minus 50 of the bond. So three quarters of, uh, of the aggregate endowment, three quarters of this thing, three quarters of the aggregate endowment is 150 minus 50 is 100. Three quarters of this is 210 minus 50 is 160. Three quarters of that is 330 minus 50 is 280. So what they've done in equilibrium is everybody, despite having a million stocks to choose from and thousands of states and all that stuff, what everybody does is hold the riskless bond, puts money in the bank, and holds the whole stock market. So the first theorem we're going to prove next time is called the mutual fund theorem which is that everybody diversifies, everybody diversifies okay, by holding, by holding uh, uh, the, the, the aggregate economy, all stocks in the same proportion, plus money in bank. Okay, so that theorem of Shakespeare of diversifying, what did it amount to do? We have a very concrete thing. You hold 10%, this person's holding 25% uh, of every stock in the whole economy, plus uh, lending, putting some money, $50 in the bank. The other person is doing three quarters of every stock in the whole economy, plus lending the money to the first person. So that's the first of the two amazing results, and I'll, I'll start next time by explaining it. Okay, so you're going to see it's going to be very concrete. The,